All right, we are currently looking at some parables that Jesus taught the multitudes while he's ministering in Capernaum, Capernaum. And so let's just dive right in. We'll look at chapter 13, verse 44. And he gives us this other parable. It says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. This is a simple but beautiful parable. The, the field is the world. The hidden treasure are God's people. Now, I know there's some groups out there that try to flip-flop this parable and make it sound like we're buying Jesus. He's the hidden treasure. No, no, no. We couldn't buy anything from the Lord. We are saved by grace alone faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. So the hidden treasure of God's people, Jesus is the man, it says, who gave all that he had. He gave his very own life, and he gave his life to redeem the hidden treasure, which is you and me, the people of this world. And for joy over the treasure, he buys the field. I see a picture of this in Mark chapter 10, verse 45. Look at this verse. It says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So he gave his life to ransom us off that slave market of sin. This gives us a little insight for the joy that was in his heart, the joy over the treasure. Hebrews 12, verse 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, he started it, he'll finish it, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, the joy that was set before him was knowing what his crucifixion would accomplish, reconciling sinful human beings like you and me back to the Father. Jesus can make new fields, new worlds, with just a word. In fact, he will. He'll create a whole new heaven, a new earth, new universe at the end of the age. And he'll do all these amazing things, but what brings him joy is the treasure he has bought and he's redeemed out of this filthy world. And again, that's you and me. At the same time, Israel is a special treasure to the Lord. Look at these verses in Psalm 135, verse 4, because God is not done with Israel. For the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel for his special treasure. In Exodus 19, verse 5, the Lord tells Moses, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And when you think about God's special treasure, Israel, I mean, they were hidden for nearly 1900 years, from 70 AD when uh, Titus destroyed Jerusalem and the temple and scattered the Jews until May 14, 1948. They were hidden, but God has brought them back into the land. And again, he's not finished with the Jewish people yet. When Christ returns, all the Jews that survived the Great Tribulation will see Christ coming back, and it says, every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and they will receive him as their long-awaited Messiah. Well, look at verse 45. This is one of my favorite parables. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the merchant is Jesus. He gave his life for us, to redeem us, to buy us. He, we're the pearl of great price. Some people try to say, no, he's the pearl. Well, you can't give anything. You can't sell anything. You can't buy Jesus. So it doesn't make any sense that way. But Satan wants all of us to understand that God could never, he doesn't want us to understand this. He wants us to believe this lie, that Satan wants us to think God can't save you. God doesn't want you. You're not valuable to the Lord. God sees you and me, though, as a treasure hidden in the field. We saw that in verse 44. Here he sees us as that pearl that is very valuable. In speaking of the beauty and the splendor, the majesty of our 
glorious kingdom. And I mentioned this last week where it talks about New Jerusalem, the dimensions of it, 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles deep, 1,500 miles high. The streets are made of pure gold. The walls are pure jasper, so clear you can see through everything. Jesus, as Aaron mentioned earlier, he's the light. The Lamb of God is the light, and it's just going to be glorious. So Pastor Chuck said this. Uh, this is a wonderful observation. Speaking of this, he said, When we see the magnificence of heaven, we will be in awe. We regard the materials, the jasper walls and gold streets, the pearly gates, as being precious and valuable. But God sees them as just building materials and decoration. He doesn't treasure them. He treasures you. We are his treasure. We are what he values most. Value is determined by its rarity. And God made only one of you. He loves you and values you and has invited you to be part of his eternal family. Now, I know that's hard for some of us to accept and to receive, but this is how God looks at us. And there's many verses that say this is how God looks at us, with love, with compassion, with grace, with mercy. When Paul is praying for the Christians in Ephesus, this is what he says in Ephesians 1.18. He's praying that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? Now, this is incredible because Paul is not talking about our inheritance, but he's talking about God's inheritance. Our inheritance is we're going to get out of here. We're going to receive resurrection bodies. We're going to dwell in his presence forever. We're going to see him face to face. That's our inheritance. But Paul is talking about the Lord's inheritance. In other words, he wants us to know that as God's children, we are his inheritance. It's as if Paul is saying, if you only knew how much God loves you, if you only knew the grace that he has bestowed upon you, if you only knew how much he values you and treasures you, and we know these verses, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's because he loves us. Many of you are familiar with Jeremiah 29, verse 11. God tells us, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. So that's his thoughts towards you, peace, not evil. He's not up there, how can I mess with Jeff today? That's not what God does. You know, he's looking for ways to bless us, looking for opportunities to put before us and give us the strength to go through those open doors. 1 John 3.16, by this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. We also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. 1 John 4.10, in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Propitiation simply means satisfying wrath. Jesus satisfied the wrath of God that we deserve because we're the guilty sinners. But Jesus took the wrath upon himself when he hung on the cross in our place. And so that's how we know he loves us. He sent Jesus to be the satisfaction of God's wrath for our sins. All this to say that Jesus loves us so much, he gave his life for us by going to the cross in our place. And it was to redeem us. It was to purchase us off that slave market of sin, and then to cleanse us of all of our sins and give us eternal life. And so what an amazing truth to receive and to understand. We are those pearls that he bought, that he loves, that he treasures. We are in his inheritance that he purchased with his own blood. Now, before any of you think, well, yeah, I deserve to be saved. Yes, I'm so beautiful. Be careful. Don't ever become arrogant. Don't ever think that you deserve anything good from God. But this should blow our minds because God's grace and mercy and compassion is so overwhelming, so amazing. After all, without Jesus, every one of us is on a fast track to the lake of fire. It's only because of His grace and His mercy that we are saved. But just at the right moment, the love of Jesus pierced our hearts, broke through the wickedness and the deception that we were bound up in. 
Now, whenever I think about these things, I don't think God is getting the better end of the deal. I mean, he did everything for our salvation. Jesus suffered and died a horrible death. He shed his perfect blood to redeem a sinful man like me. And so often I feel like an irritating little piece of nothing in compared to what God has done. I don't feel like God's inheritance, but literally a little piece of irritating nothing. That's why I love this parable of the pearl of great price so much. Again, Jesus is the merchant who gave all that he had, his very life, to buy us. Why do I say that? Why am I emphasizing a little worthless piece of nothing? Well, you know how pearls are made, right? You take a little grain of worthless sand and you put it in a oyster and that little grain of sand begins to irritate the oyster. And because of the irritation, the oyster secretes this stuff called sucre and it begins to form around that little grain of irritating sand. The more irritation, the bigger the pearl becomes. So over time, that liquid hardens. And it becomes more and more valuable the bigger it gets. Now, from our perspective, we're just little grains of sand. Some of us are more irritating than others. <laughs> but from God's perspective, God says, yes, you are. <laughs> That's okay. But in His love and by His grace, God says to us, come to Jesus and you'll find yourself in Christ." And because you are in Christ, just like that grain of sand was in the oyster, being in Christ, he wraps his robes of righteousness around you. He secretes, so to speak, his blood around you. He wraps us with his loving arms. That's why we are valuable in his sight. It's not because of us. It's all because of Jesus. And just as that little worthless grain of sand became something valuable, something special, it's because it remained in the oyster, because we're in Christ. We've been turned into new creations. The old things pass away, behold, all things become new. That's incredible. Again, these, kind of thought, um, these kinds of thoughts of God's love, His grace, His mercy, is what you know, caused the Apostle Paul to write this. The Holy Spirit inspired him to write these words. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that He would grant you, according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with might through His Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. Sounds impossible, but that's what the Spirit will work into our hearts. That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to Him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Now, if we just said, now to him who's able to do all that we ask or think, or above all that we ask or think, or abundantly above all that we ask, we would think, that's amazing. But here he says, exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. In other words, it's beyond your comprehension, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. I don't know about you, but this is a very encouraging parable to me because I know how irritating I have been. You are a pearl of great value and worth because of who Jesus is, because of everything He has done for you. He's done everything for your salvation. He paid the ultimate price, His blood shed on the cross to purchase you off that slave market of sin, to make you a new creation in Christ. So again, all the glory, all the honor, all the praise goes to Christ alone. Verse 47, he gives us another parable. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore 
And they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age, the angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. So this parable is very similar to the one we saw last week with the wheat and the tares. At the end of the age, when Christ returns and sets up his kingdom, he'll separate the wheat from the tares. We're told he bundles up the tares, the weeds, burns them in the fire, the lake of fire. Again, the tares represent the make-believers. It represents the unsaved, unrighteous people who have rejected Christ. Here we see at the end of the age, the good fish will be gathered together in good vessels, but the bad fish will be thrown into the fire as well. The only difference with these fish or the people of this world is whether or not they receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So they throw out this big net, this drag net, and whatever they bring in, they start separating it out. And that's the parable of the last days. Now he's not talking about the rapture when we're caught up into the presence of the Lord and we'll be separate, obviously, at that time. But he's talking about when Christ returns to establish his kingdom, he's going to separate the wheat from the chaff or the tares, these bad fish from the good fish, the um, make-believers from the Jews who come to Christ, and those who get saved during the great tribulation time. He will separate the, the sheep from the goats, and so, to, so to speak. But that's what he's referring to. After the rapture, there's going to be the seven-year period known as the Great Tribulation. It's known as the 70th week of Daniel. It's known as Jacob's Trouble or the time of Israel's trouble. But it's during the seven-year period that many people from all over the world are going to get saved. God will use the two witnesses there in Revelation 11. He'll use the 144,000 Jews, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes, to be witnesses for Christ. And then, if that's not enough, God will send an, uh, an angel, a mighty angel, it says, with the everlasting gospel. He'll circle the whole planet. And this is what we read in Revelation 14. Verses 6 and 7. This is how God gets the word out, because God does love the people of this world. This is what John says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the creator, the sea and springs of water. So he'll separate all those out when he returns at his second coming. But those who reject him will be lost forever in the lake of fire. It's at the end of the seven years that Jesus returns, and then he'll separate those different groups. The good fish from the bad fish. I don't know what that looks like when I go to India with Imli and he'll be out there and he'll see these people tossing these nets in the rice paddy fields. The water's like this deep. It's all muddy. I said, what are they doing throwing nets? Oh, they're catching fish. It's like, really? Yeah, they're good. It's like, uh-uh. I'm not going to eat those things. I mean, there's these little mud sucker fishy things that are in the mud and all that. And it's like, oh, they're really good. It's like, uh-uh. Uh, you can eat them. I'm not going to eat them. I still haven't eaten them. It's going to be cold day in Hades before I eat those things. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they taste better burnt. Anyway, God's going to do an amazing work in these last days. But for the second time in this chapter, Jesus says there will be weeping or wailing and gnashing of teeth. In other words, eternal torment awaits all those who reject Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They reject the gospel. Jesus died for your sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. You say, I don't want Him. I don't care what He did on the cross for me. If you die without Jesus, you will experience everlasting torment, weeping or wailing in gnashing of teeth. Jesus uses that phrase seven times in the New Testament. Well, look at verse 51. Jesus said to them, Have you understood all these things? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Well, I don't know what degree they understood, but they say, Yes, we understand. You're going to 
cast all those into the lake of fire. And as we saw last week, those who are righteous will shine like the sun in the presence of the Lord. The righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of God. Verse 52, Then he said to them, Therefore every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasure things new and old. So he's speaking to all the disciples here, and he um, says all genuine believers, disciples of Jesus, need to be like these scribes. Now there's definitely two different categories of scribes, because over and over again when we get to chapter 3, he'll say, you you know, hypocrites to the Pharisees and the scribes. You scribes, you Pharisees, you hypocrites! This is a whole different class of scribes he's referring to. These are biblical scribes. Originally, they were noble men, uh, noble leaders. They were uh, overseeing the spiritual aspects of the kingdom of God. When the Jews came back from Babylon after their 70-year captivity, Ezra was the chief scribe. He was a priest, and he was overseeing these scribes. And they were very important at that time in Israel's history. Ezra trained these scribes to preserve the Word of God, to study the Word of God, and then to um, pass out the Word of God, you know, just to share it with the next generation as they taught the people how to apply the Word to their own lives. And that's how Jesus is using this term in this parable. Like the original scribes, we should all study the Scriptures and preserve the scriptures, and pass it on to the next generation. That's what we do here. At the same time, we should be encouraging people, okay, you got the word, be in the word, study it, and then apply God's word to your everyday life. Because God's word is the ultimate treasure for us. You know, we dig into the word of God. We find what God has for us. We know who Jesus Christ is only because we have the Word of God, not because of some TV show or movie. You know who Jesus is by the very Word of God. Some see this as a reference to the Old and New Covenant when he says it brings forth things new and old, and I think that could be the case. That's why Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, that's teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. It's in the book of Nehemiah that we see Ezra the priest putting this very thing into practice. And this is actually an outline that Pastor Chuck used many years ago, uh, how we teach verse by verse expository teaching. This is where it comes from. Nehemiah chapter 8, starting in verse 8. So it says, and by the way, so it tells us before this that they built this big wooden platform and Ezra gets on it and then he begins to expound the scriptures to the people. And there's about 50,000 Jews there around the Temple Mount. And so they are Um, he's speaking, and they've got these other scribes and Levites. They pass it on to those around them. They just keep spreading it out till everybody hears the word of God. So this is what it says. They read distinctly from the book, that's God's word, in the law of God, and they gave the sense, in other words, this is what it means, and helped them to understand the reading. Again, that's what expository teaching is. And Nehemiah, who is a governor, Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn nor weep. Because as Ezra is expounding on the word of God, they're bawling, they're crying, they're weeping because they know they were in captivity for 70 years because they broke God's law. They disobeyed the Lord. Now they're hearing from the word of God probably for the first time, many of them in many, many years, and that's just breaking their hearts. So they're weeping. It says, For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow, 
And we know this part of the verse, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. In other words, there's great joy when you've been convicted by the Word of God. The Holy Spirit takes the Word and convicts us of wherever we're blown at, wherever we've done wrong, and we just surrender it to the Lord, and then there's great joy knowing that you are cleansed by the Spirit of God, by the blood of Jesus. So the Levites quieted all the people, saying, Be still, for the day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink, to send portions and rejoice greatly, because they understood the words that were declared to them. So that's a good example of how the scribes should be. They were uh, instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven, verse 52. It's like a householder who brings out his treasure, things new and old, using the whole Bible for blessing others, encouraging them, training them. From Genesis to Revelation, period, is the Word of God. There's no other books you can say, oh yeah, this is inspired by the Lord. No, it's Genesis to Revelation, period. Verse 53, Now it came to pass, when Jesus had finished these parables, that He departed from there, when he had come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astounded and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? So here we see Jesus. He's leaving Capernaum. He's traveling about 25, 26 miles to Nazareth, his hometown. That's what it's referring to here. Nazareth is where Jesus began his earthly ministry. After he was tempted for 40 days in the wilderness, after being baptized, then he goes to Nazareth. He goes into this same synagogue in Nazareth, and it tells us that they handed him a scroll of Isaiah. So they didn't have a book like we do. They were scrolls, and so they were all round up, and you'd have to spin them like this to find... They didn't have chapters and verses. So he's going to Isaiah 61. It's going to take a while. So he gets to Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2, and it found, he finds a place where it says it's written of him. And this is what we read. This is what he quotes in Luke chapter 4. And this was written 400, or 700 years earlier, Luke 4, 18. Jesus reads this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is speaking of the Messiah, Jesus because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he stops right there, he rolls the scroll back up, he hands it to the attendant, they put it away, and then he sits down, everybody sits down, he says, today this has been fulfilled in your hearing. And they're just like, whoa, who is this guy? Well, he's claiming, I'm the Messiah. I'm the one that Isaiah was talking about. This has been fulfilled in your hearing. I'm doing these things. And so what do we read in Luke 4? It goes on to tell us they got mad at Jesus. And they drag him out to, there's a cliff. If you've been over there, there's a cliff in, outside of Nazareth. And it goes down a few hundred feet. And they're going to throw him off the edge of the cliff because he's claiming to be the Jewish Messiah which he was. They didn't want to hear it. And so it says he miraculously just passed through their midst, and he goes on. And now we're about a year later, he goes back to Nazareth. You'd think by now they'd be all excited to welcome him home. Oh, here's our hometown boy made good. You know, he's been healing the sick, casting out demons, cleansing lepers, restoring eyes that are blind, raising people from the dead. That's pretty good. You'd think they'd say, welcome home. You are the Messiah. But no, that's not what they do. As we just saw in verse 54, they're still questioning him. Where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? So they're still skeptical. So verse 55, is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, and his sisters, are they not all with us? Don't they still live here in Nazareth? Where then did this man get all these things? Pause there for a moment, because when Jesus first was calling his disciples, and he's down around the Sea of Galilee, Philip gets all excited. 
and he runs to Nathanael. We have found the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. You remember Nathanael's response? What good thing can come out of Nazareth? In other words, Nazareth, that little hick town. It's kind of like Mac. <laughs> Hope you're not from Mac. I'm not being derogatory. <laughs> but you don't expect great things to come out of Mac. Or Grand Junction, by the way. Most people think Grand Junction, that's a hick town. I think, oh, I love it here. Coming from San Diego, I'm glad to be out of that place. But anyway, that's how they looked at Jesus. He's a hick from Nazareth. Nothing good comes out of Nazareth. So they couldn't believe Jesus would be their Messiah. And so they're saying, well, we know Jesus. He's the carpenter's kid. We know his mom, Mary. And she claimed way back 30 plus years ago that she got pregnant by the Holy Spirit. We all know that one. Now, that was crazy. Yeah, now all these brothers he's got, James, Joseph, Simon, and Jude, and his sisters, are they not still here with us here in Nazareth? Again, it shows us that after the miraculous conception and virgin birth, Joseph and Mary had at least six children together, these four boys and sisters. It means at least two girls. So that whole thing of the, you know, Perpetual virginity of Mary is not true. Be that as it may, notice in verse 57, So they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his own country and in his own house. Again, this is the second time we've seen the Greek word scandalon, where it says they were offended by him. That means they stumbled over Jesus. They, they were offended by his claims of being the Messiah. And it was simply because they were so familiar with him and his family. And many of you know this. This is how it was when I got saved. People that were familiar with you, especially me being such a knucklehead that I was and such a, you know, little punk that I was and so forth. You know, you get saved and then you get rejected by family and friends. You can, I knew you, Jeff. You were just that little punk so-and-so. You know, now you're telling me I need Jesus. This is especially my dad. I don't need Jesus. What are you talking about? I knew you when you were. And it's like, okay, prophet is not without honor except in his own home. <laughs> his own hometown. And that's kind of what Jesus is saying here. Now, I can understand why people would say that about me, because I was a jerk and a knucklehead. But Jesus? How could you say that about him? He was perfect in every way. He never sinned. He never stole anything. He never blamed anybody for anything. He was sinless. Now, I know that for many of you, you've experienced things like this after you got saved. A lot of people have a hard time forgiving a lot of people have a hard time forgetting some of the bad things you may have done, things that I have done. But praise the Lord that Jesus is ready, willing, and able to forgive anybody of anything that they have ever done. Praise the Lord for that. This is why verses like 2 Corinthians 5.17 are so important. We need to hold on to this. Therefore, if anyone, that means anyone, I'm a Greek scholar. Anyone here means anyone. You're like, so? That means anybody. No matter what you've done, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So it doesn't matter what you've done in the past. Jesus can cleanse, forgive, and restore, and heal, and use you for God's glory. So don't let the enemy hold you down. Again, yeah, we're that little irritating grain of sand, worthless, nothing, but in Christ, we're a new creation. In Christ, he can do amazing things. So look at verse 58. Now he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. He could have done a lot of miracles there, but he didn't. He chose not to because their hearts were so hard towards him. So when Jesus leaves Nazareth after this, He'll never go back. They blew it, you might say. He won't return. And it's still true in many ways. Jesus will not stay around a place or a person that does not want him. He'll leave. Now, it's interesting, though, because he still loves people. 
no matter what they've done, no matter how hard-hearted they are. You've heard me say it for years. I mean, before I got saved, I heard the gospel at least 25 times. And I would cuss them out. I would tell them, take a hike. I don't want to hear it anymore. I was kicking against the goads. And I would say, don't, I don't want, get out of here. I'll punch you out. I mean, I was mean. And you're like, oh, Pastor Jeff, you were never that way. My mom used to say that. And I was like, mom, come on. I'd punch her, her out if I could. You know, I mean, I was that kind of a jerk. You know what I mean? It does, I never did. But I mean, it's just crazy. You're like, whoa, wait, be careful. Don't cross that line. But we all have done things that we like, man, I can't believe I did those things. But God still loves us. Here's a great example. The church of Laodicea in Revelation 3, they didn't love Jesus. Jesus says, I'm about to vomit you out of my mouth. You're not hot. You're not cold. What do we find Jesus doing? He's outside the church. They're trying to do church their way. God says, I don't know. You got to do church my way. And they didn't want to. But he didn't just abandon them for good. He's still on the outside, gently knocking on the door. That's where we find him. Patiently standing outside the church, still knocking. This is what he says to those who no longer want him around. Revelation 3.20, you've heard this verse. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. So he's not just talking about the church of Laodicea. If anyone will open the door, that means anyone singular will open the door, I will come in. I'll dine with him. The word dine simply means to have fellowship with. I'll eat with you. Now, in that culture, to eat with somebody meant you were in fellowship with them. They would not eat with somebody they didn't like. The Jews said, well, how can you, Jesus, eat with these sinners and tax collectors? Because I love them. He wants to fellowship. So if anyone will open the door, doesn't matter what you've done, how wicked you've been, you open the door, he says, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Again, it doesn't matter how many sins you've committed. Jesus loves you and he can forgive you and he can give you eternal life. And that's how amazing God's grace is to anyone who will come to Jesus by faith. He can save and forgive the worst of sinners. I think a lot of us are going to be shocked when we get to heaven and see who's there. Whoa, you made it? <laughs> and we'll probably be shocked by who's not there. Well, what about so-and-so? They seem to be so nice. They weren't saved. But often we'll think, well, there's no way Jesus will ever save that person. What's truly amazing, though, to me is that Jesus is willing to save anybody. He saved me. He can save you. When I think of people that God got a hold of and radically saved, and after knowing how he saved a wretch like me, I'm always drawn to the testimony of a man named Saul of Tarsus. You've heard of Saul of Tarsus he was mean. He was nasty. He was having Christians put to death. Why? Because they were following the Messiah, the risen Lord and Savior. And for that, Saul tried to destroy them. Guess what happened to Saul? Well, he was walking down the road to, uh, to uh, Damascus, and he was going with official papers in hand to go arrest these wayward Jews who were following, in his mind, a false Messiah, Jesus. And I'm going to bring them back. And if I have to beat them, if I have to break up their families, and he talks about this, what he did, if I have to put them in prison, and he did, if I have to put them to death, and he says he did, I'll do those things because they're following a false Messiah. That's how zealous he was for what he thought was God. So on that road to Damascus, Jesus, the risen Savior from heaven, says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Well, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. And from that moment, Saul of Tarsus surrendered his life to the risen Savior, and he got saved. Later on, he'd become known as the Apostle Paul. And Paul knew from that moment on that if Jesus could save a brutal, angry, rebellious man like him, he, I mean, he was like a terrorist. Not much different between Paul and any other terrorist we read about. 
They hate you because of whatever, and he's going to destroy you if you don't change. That was Paul's mindset. In fact, wherever Paul went, he would not hesitate to tell other people about the love and grace and power of Jesus to forgive and save and change the most wicked people imaginable, including himself. One of my favorite sections of Scripture, I'll close with this, is in 1 Timothy 1, starting in verse 12. He's writing this just before he has his head put, you know, cut off. He's in prison in Rome, and he's writing this to his beloved son, Timothy, his son in the faith. He says, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into ministry, although I was formerly, and a lot of us can put Whatever words we want in here, Paul says, I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man. That means a violent, arrogant man. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. I didn't know what I was doing. I was out of my mind. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's why we celebrate this time of year. And then Paul says, of whom I am chief. So you want to say, oh, I'm a bad sinner. He's like, no, you don't have anything on me. <laughs> I'm the chief sinner. However, Paul says, for this reason I obtain mercy, that in me first... Jesus Christ might show all long suffering or patience as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. In other words, I'm the example. If God can save me, Paul says, after what I've done to the church, after how I've had people destroyed and killed, if he can save me, he can save anybody. I'm the pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. And so don't ever think I'm outside of God's grace, his love. Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And so God showed love and mercy. And he showered Saul of Tarsus with grace and forgiveness so that no one would ever feel like they are outside the reach of his love. So you might think, well, I did this and I did that and I was so horrible. How could God forgive somebody like me? Because God can. And he demonstrated his own love toward us. Let me close with this verse, Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners... He didn't wait for you to clean up your act. While you're still dead in your sins, Christ died for you. That's how he demonstrated his love. Don't ever think you're outside of his realm of love and compassion and forgiveness. Because if he can forgive Saul of Tarsus, if he can forgive somebody like me, and I know the wicked things I did before I got saved, the, the way I lived before I got saved, it was brutal, it was horrible. And a lot of you don't have anything over me when it comes to sin and know how to sin and come up with ways to sin. But praise the Lord that He is ready, willing, and able to forgive anyone no matter what they have done. And then use us for His glory because, again, we're just a little irritating grain of sand. We're nothing. All the value is because we're in Christ and He's wrapped His love, His grace, His blood around us. That's why we are cleansed and forgiven.